morning, everyone. It's good seeing you this morning. Uh, we are talking about thriving in our spiritual life. And if you've not picked up uh, one of the study sheets, there are study sheets out at the Welcome Center, so make sure you get one of those today as you leave. And that's uh, scripture reading for every day. And that's some questions for you to ponder this week as we, as we go through this study. Well, today, as I start off, I'm going to say something that's going to be shocking to some of you. I'm going to say a word that some of you think is a bad word, okay? And if, if, you're too, if you're too, you know, gentle to hear this kind of stuff, if it's too offensive, go ahead right now, put your fingers in your ears, okay? This is going to be shocking. I'm going to say a word right now. Here we go. You ready? Submit. Is that a bad word? Submit. You hear that word and you might go, well, who are you to tell me <laughs> to submit? I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You're telling me to submit. No one tells me to submit. <laughs> For many, that's the reaction when they hear that, that word. And I know, I know where that reaction comes from. I know where it comes from. It comes from this fear that we have. This fear of, of being taken advantage of. It might come from a history of abuse that you have, you have suffered. We may have seen relationships other relationships where a person was taken advantage of and, and that trust was betrayed, right? That trust that's foundational to healthy relationships. And because we've seen that, what do we do? We put up this self-defense, right? And the way we have chosen to protect ourselves is to vow to never submit to anyone. How do you view submission? I think sometimes um, we hear the word submit and we kind of think about the way it's used in wrestling, right? Pro wrestling. We think submission is like this chokehold where a person who is receiving it is forced to yield, right? They're forced to tap out. They, they, they have no choice but to admit that they've lost the fight. And so I say, submit, and you say, not me. I'm not, I'm not going to submit. But here is what we come up against when we decide to be followers of Jesus. We start reading the scriptures. We, we start reading our Bibles and we notice that again and again in the scriptures, this horrible, this horrible word <laughs> is used again and again in the scriptures. This horrible, wretched, offensive word. Submit. Not only is it used but it says that people who want to follow Jesus are told to submit. Can you believe that? Can you believe that would be taught in the pages of Scripture? Like you go over to Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15, and the Apostle Paul writes this. He starts off well enough, right? He starts off pretty good in this section. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use, best use of your time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord within your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul uses this bad word. Submitting to one another out of reverence 
for Christ. What is he saying there? He says, if you love Jesus, we must be doing what? Submitting to one another. How do you like that word, submit? <laughs> submit is a verb that means to yield to someone else. Do you like doing that? Do you like yielding to someone else? You know, there's this old story, maybe, maybe Rick's told it at one time or another. I know it's been around for a long, long time. But there is this old story about this ship that's traveling the high seas in the darkness. You remember this one, Rick? Captain of the ship looked into the dark, to the dark night, and what did he see? He saw this faint light in the distance. And immediately, he called the signal, signalman to send a message. And the message was, alter your course 10 degrees south. Promptly, the return message was, alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain got angry because his command was being ignored, so he sent a second message, alter your course 10 degrees south. I am the captain of this ship. Soon, another message came, alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a seaman third class. Immediately, the captain sent the third message, trying to evoke a little bit of fear, right? And he said, alter your course 10 degrees south. I'm the commander of a battleship. The reply came back, alter your course 10 degrees north. I'm the keeper of a lighthouse. <laughs> Do you like to yield do you like to submit to somebody else? Do you like to submit to other people? And submission has become a bad word in our society. And, and we make heroes of people who won't submit, right? We make heroes of people who, who do not submit to anyone else's authority. And don't misunderstand. Um, there is a time to stand up against oppression there is a time to come to the defense of those who need protected. There is a time to reject illegitimate authority. However, you read through the pages of Scripture, you read through your New Testament, and we see that the Christian life is marked by things like love, <laughs> unity, humility, And yes, that bad word, submission. Just like it says in Philippians 2, 1 and 2, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Let me ask you this. What do you value? Do you value the people around you? Do you value those people you share life with? Do you value those people? Or are you in competition with those people? <laughs> or do you always have to get the upper hand on those people? Do we hear the truth of the Word of God and begin applying it to other people's lives first <laughs> before we apply it to our lives? And see, here's something, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to be growing in our spiritual lives, we need to get over this stuff. These are things we need to get over. See, we celebrate God's grace in our own lives, but sometimes have a really hard time applying the grace of God to anybody else. We need to learn to not be proud, not be arrogant, not be selfish, we need to learn to be forgiving and humble and submissive.
There are a lot of people who believe when we talk about submission that it means you're a doormat for other people. That's not what we're talking about. And this may shock you. That is not submission. Do you know what that is? It's called codependency. Codependency is when we enable someone else in their destructive behavior and their destructive tendencies. That's not submission. Biblical submission is not codependency. And see, we think that if we would practice submission, that in some way we would be losing our dignity, we would be losing our own identity, and that's not the case. So today, here's what I want to do. I want to go through some ways, some main ways that we find in the New Testament that Christians are called to submit. We're going to see some verses that talk about all the relationships in which the Christian practices submission. And what we'll see is that in all of these relationships, submission actually goes both directions, right? Submission is never a one-way street. In every case, you'll see somebody who's being told to submit, but then the party, the other party, actually has an increased responsibility to the one who is submitting. Let's look at a few of these. Submission of children to parents, right? How many think we need, to be, we need to reinforce this, right? We love to quote these verses to our kids, especially when our kids are getting mouthy, right? <laughs> and yes, the Bible says children should submit to their parents, but do not leave out the responsibility that the parent has to the child, right? Don't leave out the responsibility that a parent has to the child. The, the, the Bible teaches that the parent should not be too hard on their child. The Bible teaches the parent should not be a demotivating factor in the life of their child. The parent should not discourage them. The parent should not anger them, but love them and teach them then to love Jesus. Even here, submission is a what? It's a two-way street, isn't it? Submission in marriage. This is a touchy subject, right? <laughs> submission in the marriage relationship. There are a lot of women who admittedly edit these words out of their Bibles, right? And they'll jokingly say, yeah, I know what it says, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> Can you do that, wives? Especially if you want to be a follower of Jesus. Can you do that? You can't say that you love the Lord and that you're just going to edit things out of the Bible that you don't like. And I think we don't like it because we're not really understanding what it is saying when it talks about submission in the marriage relationship. It says in these verses that the wife needs to submit to her husband, but the other side of that coin is what? In that relationship, the husband needs to do what? What's the two-way street here, right? The wife is supposed to submit to the husband, but the husband is supposed to do what? The husband is supposed to love her enough that he sacrificially gives of himself for her, right? Right? There's that two-way street. And if you love that woman enough that you would die for her, you're not going to treat her poorly, are you? You're not going to not consider her in life. You're going to want to share life with her. You're not going to want to run life for her. And I can't, I can't answer this for you ladies, but would you have a problem submitting to a man if you were totally convinced he loved you sacrificially. Would you have a problem with that? <laughs> and guys, would you have a problem um, loving a woman sacrificially if you knew she respected you? And see, here is that balance in the marriage relationship, right? 
There's also talks about in Colossians 3.22, submission at work. Now, you read these, these verses and the principles are communicated in the context of that you know, master-slave relationship. But Paul says when you work for someone else, do it like you are working for Jesus. When you're working for somebody else, be a person of integrity. That's not a one-way street either. Bosses, remember that you're not the ultimate authority. You yourselves will have to give an account for, the work, for your work to God. So be fair to those who are working for you. Once again, that relationship is a two-way street. And those, all of those relationships go bad when there is a lack of balance of submission. Another way the Bible says we're to submit is we're to submit to civil authority. We're to submit to civil authority. That's mentioned in 1 Peter 3, uh, 2.13, Titus 3.1, but I think Paul's teaching is the clearest, um, but it also is the one that makes us a little bit more uncomfortable when we read verses like Romans 13, 1 through 7. And when you read that section, he teaches that we're supposed to obey the law. We're supposed to pay our taxes. We're supposed to respect our governing officials. Is that hard for you sometimes? Is that hard for you sometimes? Somebody said right now. It's hard when uh, governments seem to stand for evil rather than stand for good. It's hard, right? It's hard when our taxes go to things that we find morally objectionable. It's hard when leaders don't seem to deserve respect. But I want you to remember this. When Paul writes this, who's in charge? The Romans, right? Remember, Paul, who is speaking in the book of Romans, is talking to Roman Christians. And do you think they agree with their government? They don't. The people Paul was writing to at this point didn't have any Christian influence in their government. But even that government, like what happened when someone stole something? What would they do? They'd do exactly what we do today, right? Somebody stole something. They would call the authorities. The authorities would show up and enact justice. What happened when somebody murdered someone? What would happen? They would call the authorities, the authorities would show up, and they would do what? They would enact justice. From God's perspective, that is what government is supposed to do. That is the sense in which we are supposed to support and respect government. God has given government to enact justice. And if you remember... In the Roman Empire at this time, Caesar was the emperor. Everything belonged to who? Everything belonged to Caesar. He was their king. They were living in his country. And that's hard for us to understand because our form of government is one that we live under. And, and do we have a king? Well, we don't have a human king, do we? in our form of government. Actually, our government was founded that God is the king of everything, right? Anybody who's ever studied civics knows that the American government is not one that goes here and there by the whims of people holding offices. Our country is owned by its citizens, not its government. Our country is ruled by its documents, not by individuals. So our form of government has traditionally seen things like political dissent as being protected speech. And so we read these verses, and it's really hard for us to understand how to apply it. Um, even though in our country, 
I believe Christians need to take advantage of our opportunity to speak up about things, to speak up about morality, to vote according to what we believe. But you know what we still need to do? We still need to pay our taxes. And we still need to obey the law. And the flip side to this is that we acknowledge that who still really is the king? Even when we don't agree with our government, who is the king? God is the king of everything. This is something that was beautifully articulated for us in our founding documents. God ultimately is the judge of everything. God ultimately is the judge of the United States of America. And Paul even teaches us in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, listen to this, I don't know if you ever, ever read this verse or not, but Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, or do you not know, listen to this, do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? Did you know that, Christian? Ultimately, the Lord's people will judge the world. So here is this balance and submission, right? What do we do now? We submit the civil authority, right? But ultimately, what is our role? We're going to be sitting in judgment of the entire world. Um, another way we're told to submit in the scripture is we need to be submissive to our spiritual leaders. You read about that in Hebrews 13, verse 17, that we should submit to church leadership because ultimately it is their responsibility to God, right? Um, and we're supposed to make their work a joy and not a burden. We also see this in 1 Peter 5, 3, that they then, even though we're submitting to our church leadership, we should make their work a joy, not a burden. And the flip side of that is that they're not supposed to lord their authority over us but they're supposed to be examples for us of how we live lives pleasing to God. There's that balance, that mutual submission in that relationship. And then obviously, the obvious one about submission is we need to be in submission to God. How do you do that? James 4, 7 and 8, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. We resist evil in order to submit to God. We resist Satan in order to submit to our Lord. C.S. Lewis wrote, there is no neutral ground in the entire universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. I don't know if you remember that old Bob Dylan song, but you gotta serve somebody, right? It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you serve somebody. And so to come to God, to submit to God, we need to turn away from the wrong things that tempt us. We need to begin following what God desires for us. Second thing, we submit by coming near to God. Those verses said we need to come near to him and he will come near to us. There are people who do not want to repent of their sin, do not want to turn to Jesus, don't want to give up what they're doing with their life in order for God to forgive them. What does it say in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God and he will freely pardon. God wants to forgive you. And we submit to him 
uh, this is a part of what we're doing when, when we have people that, that come forward to be baptized, right? It really is this big, this big sh show and act of submission, submitting somebody's life, right, to God. Person comes forward, they, uh, they obviously believe that they're, they've decided that they want to make this change in their life. And so the apostles taught us that the way we do that, we, we join with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection, but we got to submit ourselves to that, right? There, there are those who reject baptism altogether and say every reference in the New Testament referring to baptism is just a spiritual baptism. And there are dozens of other ideas and, and opinions out there about what baptism is for and what it means. Um, and over the years, man, I have worked through countless numbers of discussions with people who come up with these big, elaborate theological constructs to explain why baptism is not essential. But when you ask the question, how did those early Christians submit themselves to God in order to be forgiven and indwelled with the Holy Spirit? You know what the answer is? We can have these big theological arguments all day, but when you go back to history, what actually did they do? And so the apostles taught when they taught on the subject, this was the result of that teaching. The early Christians believed in practice that it was at your baptism that your sins are forgiven and that you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 2.38. What happens when you submit yourself in that way? Scripture teaches that's when you actually put on Christ. Galatians 3.27. Right? It's like you're putting on Jesus. <laughs> so then God looks at you, and who does he see? He sees Jesus. We're taught that this is when we're sharing in what Jesus did. We're sharing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's Romans 6, 4. We're told that is, it is at your baptism that you are saved and that you can have a clear conscience before God. That's 1 Peter 3.21. And this also meets that balance of submission that we talked about earlier. The fact that Jesus himself submitted to becoming a human being, Jesus submitted himself to being baptized. And then what kind of life did he live? He lived a humble life, right? He lived a life where he came and he taught and he died on a cross and he rose from the dead, all for whose benefit? We're asked to submit to him, right? But he did what he did for whose benefit? For my benefit and for your benefit. Do you have a problem submitting to someone like that? <laughs> so that the person who believes, so that the person who is willing to repent, the person who's willing to submit themselves to being immersed or join with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection and become brand new, become forgiven, become an indwelled creation of the Almighty God. Are you willing to submit? I know. I know it's a bad word. <laughs> but the question still remains. Are you willing to submit? We're going to go ahead and sing a song this morning. If you want to make a decision for the Lord, you come forward as we all stand up together and as we sing this song together. Let's sing I Surrender All once again.